Good afternoon. My name is John Hawley. I work for VMware. And while I can't be with you today, I'm glad that I've got this opportunity to record the, this particular talk and be able to share it with you, not only now during the, the Open Source Summit conference, but uh, uh, with uh, uh, those of you who are going to find this afterwards. I hope you find this useful. Um, today I'm going to be talking about uh, um, bridges, bonds, and taps going beyond ETH0, basically a, 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 an hour-long dive into uh, some advanced networking topics to try and get people up to, to speed on some of the things that not only exist in the networking world, but specific, yeah, specifically that uh, um, Linux can, uh, can do with uh, its networking stack. And so let's start by covering some of the basics. Um, effectively, th there are two types of network interfaces. There's the physical kind. So Ethernet, InfiniBand, Token Ring, Wi-Fi, these are the kinds of uh, um, interfaces that have a physical presence. Basically, they um, interact with the physical world in some way. Ethernet, obviously, you plug a cable in and uh, um, through some analog uh, uh, twiddling of uh, um, uh, uh, electricity, you can transmit data. Um, InfiniBand, Token Ring, both work on a, sim a, a similar set of, of principles. Um, Wi-Fi, instead of plugging a physical cable in, you make a, a, a connection through uh, um, literally the air, uh, um, through the RF spectrum. And there's many more types of physical interfaces. I'm not going to try and list them all because I will invariably uh, miss something. Uh, um, but basically, the, 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 the physical interconnect uh, 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 at some point, the, the physical piece of hardware, that is what we're referring to when we're talking about a physical interface. Now, there's also things like logical interfaces. So the, these tend to wrap more complex uh, 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 concepts or higher la layer protocols or just provide functionality that you literally do not need um, hardware for. So things like a, a bridge or a bond uh, uh, or a, a tunnel or a network tap or even the loopback interface. These are going to be logical network interfaces. They're still going to be present on the system, um, at least in the, the uh, at the very least in the case of loopback. Um, but these have a tendency to wrap different concepts into slightly bigger pieces. Um, but Let's back this up a little bit. What is a network interface? It is a mechanism of transmitting data at its most fundamental level, basically. It's the physical layer of the OSI model. And I'm going to refer back to the OSI model a lot today. Um, but keep in mind, the OSI model is a complete lie. Um, the only reason the OSI model has persisted to this day is it actually is a, a reasonable way to at least start discussing things about uh, um, the networking stack. But the networking stack munges and moves uh, um, uh, across these uh, hypothetical layers far too much for them to actually be uh, uh, an actual representative uh, uh, example. Now, we're also, for today's purposes, not really going to get above layer four. Um, session, presentation, and the application layer for the OSI model um, all, uh, all tend to happen in the actual application. I'm trying to talk about stuff that's a bit uh, lower down, down in the network, or down in the, the kernel space, down in the network space, even out onto the physical wires or, or out into the, the physical uh, um, airwaves. Uh, uh, but we are going to talk about one to four pretty extensively today. And as you can see, I, I've uh, uh, rummaged through my own uh, uh, drawer uh, uh, full of networking cards and pulled out a bunch that... Uh, 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 people can see here, and there's everything from PCM, CIA uh, um, network adapters here, all the way through Wi-Fi adapters, and token ring, and all kinds of bits and pieces. If you've been around the, if you've been around the hardware world long enough, some of these will look uh, uh, a bit familiar. Um, but what do you, you know, oh, we get what an inter network interface, but what about the rest? What about the the data light? The, the, the data link layers. You know, what about the pieces that exist uh, uh, above it? You know, mostly, they're, they're, everything is built on top of the physical layer. Um, things like bridges and teams, bonds, tons, taps. You know, these pieces don't really make any sense, for the most part, 
um, without some sort of lower level physical interface. So if you've got a, a, a bond, well, you can't actually have a bond without having something to bond together. So you need a physical interface to, to do a bond or a team. Um, you can have a tunnel, but you can't actually do anything with the tunnel if it can't go anywhere. Um, and that's kind of the, the, the real difference between the physical layer, which is obviously layer one on the, the OSI model, and the kind of the data link layer, which is um, where some of these more logical uh, um, network interfaces live. So keep that in mind when we're we're discussing some things here. And we're going to get down pretty far in, into some pretty silly things here. Okay. So we've, we've sort of talked about the physical layer where you physically plug a cable in. And we've sort of talked about the, the data link layer. We're still going to be in the data link layer with this. But I want to take a second to explain uh, uh, VLANs. These are things, this is a, a, a virtual LAN. Conceptually, this takes a, a, a physical switch or a physical network and allows you to segregate it into logical different uh, um, networks. And the reason that th this kind of came about was you can only put so many network interfaces into a computer, um, even by today's standards with you know the, the number of PCI Express lanes that we've got, you can only have so many network interfaces. And it's nice in a lot of different scenarios to have forced segregation of um, your network traffic. So example of this, let's say I have an administrative interface for uh, an application and I have a storage network and uh, I obviously have some sort of mechanism to push data back out onto the, the public internet. Now the public internet is obviously a very scary place. You don't want the public internet interfacing with your um, your storage network or your administrative network. And in fact, you probably don't even want your administrative network talking to your storage network, not because it's exactly insecure, although it could be, um, but because the storage network may actually be very sensitive to latency or bandwidth, and you don't want random traffic from the administrative network coming into your storage network and potentially disrupting things. So what the VLAN does is it actually tags each packet um, as it uh, um, uh, uh, transits the network. Now, in some cases, the the machine that's actually sending the data is tagging the 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 VLAN information, and this is uh, um, it, depending on what parlance you use, because in the networking world, practically every vendor uses their own different definition of everything. But um, the, the this is sometimes referred to as a trunk. Or, uh, uh, but, but really what it is, is it, it is the, the end device that is actually doing the tagging. There is one other way, um, generally speaking, or that you can do uh, uh, tagging with, and that is to tag the default traffic or all traffic from the interface. Um, you can combine these. So if you don't tag anything, the, the, the upstream network switch um, may tag all of that, uh, uh, all of those packets for you you may never know that you're actually on a VLAN. Um, or you may be given a, effectively explicit permission to communicate on a VLAN, uh, an ID, which is literally just a number. It's a, a number between zero, uh, 1 and 4096. Uh, um, there, there are only you know, 4,000 VLANs that you, you can put on a, network, on a single network. Um, uh, uh, but the idea there is that um, the machine that's sending the packet out will, you know, may tag its packets and say, I would like my storage network or my storage packets to, to go onto the storage network, which may, let's just call it VLAN 757. Um, and my administrative information, you know, all of, you know, access to to configuration files and, and whatnot, that is going to happen on VLAN 20. Um, it may set up virtual interfaces over the top of the physical interface uh, um, to be able to, to tag those packets correctly. And the nice thing about this is that since they are logically distinct, both not only in the Linux kernel, but in, in, on the, the network itself, obviously, um, you can run different uh, uh, IP protocols all over them. You can run different IPs on them. You can do a lot of different things. They're, they're, for all intents and purposes, once you've set up the VLAN, it is 
another new physical interface that you can uh, uh, configure and, and work with. In fact, almost everything we're going to be talking about today, once you've got it set up, you can treat it as a new interface to, to put IP addresses against or uh, um, tunnel across or do, do any of these kinds of things. But I do want to specifically call out VLANs because these can be really important to a network topology. They're also very, very common, particularly in large uh, um, deployment scenarios or even pro most production scenarios just because the network segregation you can get out of it is very, very good. Now, a brief discussion of security. It is possible to escape VLANs. Most of that has been taken care of in the intervening years, but if you are absolutely convinced that you need the, the greatest possible security, using no VLANs is the correct answer. I don't think that that's necessarily, I, I don't think it's necessarily a threat model that needs to be completely worried about today. I think that the advantages right now outweigh the potential uh, uh, security or security perceived security risks, um, as there hasn't been a whole lot of issues with VLANs in the last decade and a half. So, probably a little bit deeper dive on VLANs than uh, um, I'd normally go into, but I want to make sure that people are aware that VLANs exist and that th sort of how these works. And we'll get back to these um, as I, I start bringing up examples and start showing exactly how you can kind of put some of these pieces together. Bridges. Now, those of you who are, are, are doing a lot of virtual machines or whatnot, bridges are going to be, uh, you know, almost a given. They're going to be ubiquitous in, in what you're going to see. Now, and a bridge is basically just a software-defined switch inside of the, the computer itself. So the, the Linux can set up uh, um, this interface that many other things can bind to. And you can assign IP addresses to the bridge itself. Um, the, the, the bridge can just, you know, once you, you've got it set up, you could treat it exactly like a normal, you know, effectively like ETH0 in this case. So um, in, in this particular diagram, you've got a, a real network switch. It's out on the network um, and it is connected to ETH0 on this mythical computer. And inside this mythical computer, we've set up bridge zero and inside uh, uh, of the computer, it's obviously a, a, a virtual machine, uh, a hosting server. It's got a bunch of virtual machines. Uh, uh, those virtual machines then connect to the bridge itself. And basically inside the computer, when the virtual machine wants to talk out to the network, what it does is it talks to the bridge and the bridge um, does the exact same thing a normal you know, physical switch would do is it says, I am trying to talk to 192.168.11. Not that this is exactly a good IP address to ever try and talk to, but... Uh, um, and the bridge says, well, I don't know exactly where this is, but I do know that the next hop is probably ETH0. So it passes the traffic onto ETH0, ETH0 then passes it onto the proper switch, and then the the the, the rest of the switching infrastructure does the, the thing you would expect in terms of uh, passing that packet along so that it can get to the, the final destination. Um, and bridges are, are inside of the, uh, the Linux kernel are actually really pretty powerful. There's a lot you can do with them. Most people don't actually think about them as a full proper, you know, switch inside a, a, of the computer, but they really, they really are. You can attach VLANs to them. You can pass VLAN uh, um, tags through them. You can um, run spanning tree protocol on them and, you know, a, a number of other pieces. And there's a lot of concepts that you can do inside uh, um, of the Linux kernel with bridges that effectively mimic exactly what you can do on a physical switch. Um, the only real downside to a, a, a bridge inside of the, the inside of a computer is that it may not be quite as fast as the actual uh, a switching fabric inside of an, a, a, a real physical switch. And that's because the, the real physical switch has ASICs that are specifically designed to handle all of this and inside the, the computer, just the normal CPU is handling this. And it's not literally, you know, purpose built to, to kind of handle that kind of thing. So that is what a br bridge is. So let's move on a little bit. Um, bonds. Now, there are two concepts here in terms of bonding. Um, there are bonds and there are teams. In a lot of cases, particularly when you're looking for information about this stuff, you're going to find that these terms are used interchangeably. 
in the Linux kernel, they are not exactly interchangeable. Um, so let, let's talk about bonds first. Uh, um, basically, what a bond does is it takes multiple physical uh, um, interfaces. Now, I say physical, but you can kind of, this gets a little mungy. Um, it takes two interfaces and amalgamates them in some fashion. Uh, um, and the Linux kernel knows about six types of uh, um, network bonding. There is the round robin, there's active backup, XOR, broadcast, dynamic link aggregation, i.e. 802.3AD, TLB, and ALB. Now, this is a lot of gobbledygook. Uh, um, the, the, and a lot of words uh, to describe the, these kinds of bonding. But more or less, these six types define how traffic is either going to come in or go out of the network interfaces. Um, round robin is going to, uh, um, basically, one packet goes out one interface, one packet will go out the next interface, and it will basically cycle a packet until it reaches the end of the interfaces and start back over and just keep doing that literally in a round robin fashion. Active backup, what this will do is it basically treats two interfaces as if one is actively always doing traffic until it goes down for some reason. And then all of the traffic will switch over to the backup link. And you can have multiple backup links and, and um, chain those in, in, in interesting ways if you need. Most people, it's just a single active backup. XOR does some uh, um, interesting mathematics to try and, and uh, um, switch traffic depending on where it's coming from or where it's going on which interface it goes out of. Broadcast is a little complicated, but I'm not going to get too far into it. The most common bonding that you're, you're probably going to ever run into is dynamic link aggregation or 802.3AD. This is basically the industry, stand, industry standard for what all of these things eventually all kind of merged into as a single actual standard. Switches support this, Linux supports this, almost everything supports this if they support bonding. Um, and, and this is primarily what you're going to see. And then you've got TLB and ALB, which kind of do some sim uh, similar things, but they, they're, again, different takes on how to hash information. Now, several of these, you do not need active switch support to actually work. Things like round robin or active backup, um, you don't actually need active switch support for, for these things to work correctly. For several of the others, you do actively need the switch to cooperate in, in some of this transaction so you can't you know if you if you have a dumb switch um and we use dumb to refer to switches that don't have any smarts or easy configurability to them you just literally plug a cable in and they don't they, they just pass traffic there's no web interface there's no there's no configuration of them um there's no way to set up several of these now the fact that several some of these you know things like active backup or round robin you don't need an upstream switch to to help you that's really quite cool um because that means that you can get some of the advantages of a full proper you know something like 802.3 ad without having full switch support however there are some caveats to to um uh, um how bonds work and, and the, the biggest misconception about how bonds work is that when you bond two interfaces together, you get an you get double the bandwidth. And this is sort of true and sort of wrong. The real answer is, is that a single stream of data will still only traffic or transit data as fast as the, the, the link it is on. So if you have a one gig link and you take, you know, or you, you have two one gig links and you bond them together, um, into let's say 802.3 AD, the fastest any single piece of traffic will move in or out of the system will be one gigabit. It will never get to two gigabits. Now, that that's for single stream. When you start talking about multiple streams, and this is why a lot of big servers ha have bonds, particularly 802.3 AD bonds in them, is that multiple streams are now can uh, are, are now all fighting for one or more interfaces and each one of these streams may be able to actually 
you know, peek out the, the entire interface. And what things like 802.3AD um, allow you to do, what these bonds allow you to do, is now uh, 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 stuff coming in on, uh, um, in this particular example, E0, it may be going at a gigabit or 10 gigabits or 40 gigabits or 100 gigabits, um, while another computer can be coming in um, on ETH1 and also getting, you know, 10, 40, 100 gigabits uh, um, of traffic into the system. And that is where you start seeing systems that are able to push, you know, 20 gigabits if they have two 10 gigabit interfaces bonded together, or, you know, uh, uh, 80 gigabits if they've got two 40 gig um, interfaces bonded together and whatnot. And one thing to also kind of keep in mind with the way, particularly Ethernet, I'm not, this does not apply to Wi Fi or the RF spectrum stuff usually, um, or certain like 10 megabit uh, uh, Ethernet, but full duplex connections can actually transmit data at full speed in both directions. Now, what, what does that mean? That means that on a gigabit interface, you can have data coming in at a gigabit and going out at a gigabit simultaneously. And this is kind of the, 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 the reason you want full duplex is because you can actually talk and listen at the same time and you get full speed at the same time. So um, th this is why when you see people calculating, you know, like PCI Express bandwidth needs for an interface, they start talking about, well, you need kind of a little bit more than 2x, you know, what your interface speed. So if you, you need, if you've got a gigabit interface, well, you need two gigabits of PCI Express bandwidth to actually fill the entire pipe in both directions. So there you go. Um, so yeah, so th there's a lot of different ways that you can kind of put these bonds together. Um, and they do some really interesting things. Obviously the Linux kernel inside of the Linux kernel, this is all happening there, um, has about, it knows about six different types. Now you, at some point you're going to say, but there's kind of all these other weird types of bonds and, and teams. And this is where the bonds and teams distinction actually comes into play. And the, the, the biggest difference between bonds and teams is fundamentally a user space configuration portion versus an all kernel space argument. The way the Linux kernel bonding system works is it's all in kernel space. All of your interaction with it goes through the Linux kernel uh, um, and it, everything that, that deals with the negotiation, all of that happens in kernel space. This has some really nice advantages. The, the, the biggest of which is that almost every kernel that's out there can easily take advantage of this. It, it's, you know, even if you, you have to load a module or something, this is available to you. Um, now Teams, the way it is used in, in, in the, the Linux world, um, refers to a user space configuration system, um, usually coming out of libteam. Um, where the admin tasks for setting up and configuring and babysitting the, um, the, the bonding information all comes out of a user space datum, libteam in this case, or team D. Um, why would you care about this? Well, for starters, the Linux kernel development process goes fairly slowly and you don't want to, to, to play with it too much just because when you play with things too much, you have a tendency to break them and you don't break things in the Linux kernel. It's just like rule number one, you don't break things there. Well, when you push something out, out into user space, you can decouple yourself from the, uh, um, the kernel development cycle and you can run your own development cycle. So that's actually a pretty big um, advantage there for the, the, the user space side. Um, you do get some minor protections from uh, some of this actually happening in user space versus kernel space, although you still end up configuring a lot of the, the kernel space to do stuff. So this isn't super, um, it, it, this fundamentally isn't more secure just because it's in user space. But the real big advantage that Teams has over bonds is that it can actually support a more complicated, more cohesive set of features out of all of the bonding uh, uh, systems. Now, it can do things like 802.3AD, it can do XORG, it can, uh, it, it can do all of the same things that the, the kernel bonding layer can. But there are certain features, particularly in 802.3AD, that the kernel driver does not support, but that Teams does. Case in point, 
the the Linux kernel driver does not support uh, rebalancing um, the network streams as they, they're coming in and out, which 802.3 AD does support uh, um, a, a mechanism by which the the switch and the the computer can renegotiate which stream is going over which interface, um, so that you can actually kind of load balance the, the the interfaces a little bit better. The kernel space does not support this. Uh, um, Teams in user space does support this. So this is, you know, uh, uh, one of the, the reasons that something like Teams um, is interesting to, to, to folks building out networks. Now, the gotcha with Teams, beyond this is also in user space and everything, is it is not as widely adopted as Bonds. So if you're, you're, if you're on like a Red Hat or a Fedora or a CentOS um, derived uh, uh, system, you have pretty easy access to LibTeam. If you're on Debian, you do not have easy access to this. You would have to actually compile it yourself and do a bunch of stuff. There's not pre-built packages for any of this, and it's not kind of bolted into the underlying configuration system uh, uh, for your, um, your network stack. And that can be, when things aren't really bolted into your underlying configuration uh, uh, pieces here, that gets kind of complicated to use. So this is why bonds general this is why when you're looking around in the Linux space, you're almost universally going to see bonds. Um, but if you have the the advantage to take a look at some of the teaming stuff and play with some of it, it really is quite powerful and in and in some cases it's actually um very, very nice uh, uh, to be able to take advantage of it. It does use a completely different configuration syntax. Um, and one of the things to keep in mind, as you know, there, there's a little bit of uh, a FUD out there between Bonds and Teams. Teams does not actually incur a performance penalty on the 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 the, the, the teamed interfaces. All of that still happens inside of the kernel. It is just the administrative pieces that that bounce back out to user space, get a little bit of processing, and then go back out on the wire. Um, things like how do you 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 explain to the switch upstream? um that you want to, to to move some traffic around um on the the interfaces and that's which they're, they're, it's not time critical it's not going to be a huge deal and ultimately once it's actually gotten out uh the interface it's going to give you a it's probably going to give you a performance inter boost anyway so that's bonds versus teams now taps for any of you who uh, um have been around for long enough. You'll you'll recognize the pictures here as vampire taps for old thicknet uh, um, uh, uh, interfaces, and that's kind of where this idea of tapping comes from. And particularly if you're going to take a look at VPNs, you're going to see uh, tons and taps uh, uh, come up a lot. Taps refer to network tapping. Tons refer to to, to tunneling. Um, and Really, all a tap is is it, it's exactly like the these these old devices that that you see here is they take a look at the network and they will listen to everything. Um, they're they're literally just like tapping a wire and listening to everything that's coming across the wire. Um, and when you're looking at VPNs, particularly OpenVPN, um, has a mode where you can run this and uh, run the network in tap mode. Um, what this means is that you can actually pass all of the traffic that is coming across the network from the data link layer perspective. As you can see, we're still at layer two when we're talking about this. Um, this has some really interesting advantages, particularly on a VPN. Um, but I think that the disadvantages far outweigh any of the potential advantages. Um, for example, if you've got, um, let, let's just take some sort of uh, a castable um device in your house you could hypothetically cast across a vpn because the if you're on the vpn it just it, and you've got a network tap on both sides it literally just looks like you're on the same network segment it's just a very slow uh, uh um instantiation of those network segments so I'm not going to spend too much time on this. I, I want people to be aware that this is out there and exactly kind of the the the, the physical a analog to this, which is literally just you're, you're tapping a cable and you're also, uh, um, you, you are literally seeing and transmitting on it the exact same fabric um, from a, a, a data link layer perspective. Tons, tunnels, 
you, we actually move up a, a layer here. Um, and instead of getting all of the raw protocol pieces, now we've actually moved into needing something like um, TCP IP to actually start being able to route the traffic. Now we're talking about routed networks instead of just passing raw uh, frames across. Um, this is, a, a, a tunnel is definitely more like having a, 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 a virtual wire or a, um, a or, 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 or a virtual network segment um, across um, the, 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 the pieces that you're attempting to communicate across. And this comes up not only in VPNs, but some virtual machine systems actually use tunnels um, to tunnel into you know, bridges or out um, into the main networks or various other things along those lines. Um, but really, and in some cases, this is literally just putting one tunnel, you know, one network inside of another network. That's, you know, kind of the idea of what a tunnel is, is you, you are tunneling a network across another, another network. Um, again, this comes up in VPNs. So things like OpenVPN, um, use a tunnel interface. Um, I think WireGuard at one point used a, a tunnel interface and now it kind of uses its quasi own thing. Um, but uh, things like uh, uh, IPv6 uh, um, in IPv4. So if you're sending an IPv6 packet and using IPv6 to IPv4 gateways to, 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 to bounce things around, you actually end up encapsulating IPv6 in an IPv4. It goes out a tunnel uh, to your far endpoint and then gets uh, um, unwrapped out of IPv4 and back into IPv6 before it can then transit as if it was normally IPv6. Um, that's kind of where this is all going to come up. This is kind of where you're going to see it. Um, I don't think I need to spend too much more time on that, but I do want to spend a little bit of time talking about loopback. Um, so far, we've talked about uh, um, some physical interconnects. We've talked about how to kind of munge some physical interconnects. We've talked about uh, um, some pieces where your um, you know, pushing tra you know, pushing raw raw network frames or tunneling traffic, but the loopback interface is a, 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 an interface that everybody sort of conceptually knows about. They all know that one twenty seven zero zero one exists. They all know that one one or uh, colon colon one um, exists, but most people don't actually know that one twenty seven zero 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 slash eight is explicitly defined as the loopback address range in RFC eleven twenty two. Um, specifically section 3.2.1.3. That means that there are 16,777,215 uh, uh, IPs, um, which is slightly, which is one more than a, a normal class C because there's no broadcast address, that you can actually fake interesting networks inside of your own computer. Now, if you do go and you read RFC 1122, the loopback interface is not allowed to leave the machine it's on. And there, there's unbelievably good reason for this. Um, but this does mean that you can put together really complicated networks, uh, um, vir vir virtual uh, um, networks inside of your computer that only use loopback addresses. Okay, so putting together really interesting and complex networks inside your own computer, okay, that's one thing to do. But why would you actually care about having um, multiple loopback addresses beyond just 127.001. I'll give you an example that I, I'm using in my own house. Um, so for a variety of reasons, I not only run my own uh, 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 my own DNS, so I have a bind server that does uh, um, uh, uh, chained resolving uh, 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 in my house, but for a variety of reasons, there are certain networks that I need to provide a slightly different DNS to. Um, I've got an IoT network that I need to to fund, munge a, a, a couple of the uh, um, uh, the domains so that they go to different places, and I uh, uh, have a couple of uh, situations where um, certain services do not like IPv6 for various reasons, and I need to resolve those as IPv4 only. Now, there's lots of different ways I could have done this. The way I ended up choosing doing this was that I actually have multiple um, versions of bind running inside uh, my firewall. And one of them binds to all of the interfaces except for um, 127.002 and 127.003.
and the 127.002 and 127.003 both refer to new versions of bind. And those versions of bind uh, uh, bind to to those IP addresses onto the standard port, and that uh, they can just run normally. Now, why would I do that? Why wouldn't I just change what port they're on? Well, I can change what port bind is running on. That's easy. But being able to trivially just move it to a, a, a bind and bind it to a new IP address, it has a different, you know, it has some really interesting advantages. Mainly, I don't have to muck with uh, uh, taking over some other port that may that I may need to use later for something else, or that that already has some pre-established uh, um, fundamental function. And on top of that, I only care about these resolvers inside the firewall itself. The firewall, these don't need to be exported in any other useful way. So, basically, that is kind of what uh, um, loopback addresses are for. They give you places where you can actually attach things inside the computer to the, their expected ports on different interfaces. Or, in the rather extreme example here, it gives you... Um, about a trillion <laughs> different ports inside the computer that you could bind things to because you have um, a full 127 or, or 127.0008 um, network range as IP addresses that you can bind things to. Each of those IP addresses you can bind, you know, thousands of, of um, ports to. This adds up pretty quickly. So that is why loopback exists, not only so that you can find yourself and do various things against yourself, but so that you can actually build out weird and complicated systems for networking and services inside of your machine without them having to be exposed out to the internet. Okay, I've talked a lot about really vague concepts at this point. I haven't actually talked about any real world potentially uh, uh, honest uh, uh, example. And so we're going to jump right into an example. Uh, um, literally, that I that, that this is actually an example that I, I literally have running um, in production right now. And um, this kind of amalgamates and crams a bunch of these concepts all together. And I want to talk about why I picked this example. If, uh, uh, the the and the biggest reason I, I picked this example is I wanted to show how you can kind of layer these pieces together to get very interesting functionality that you otherwise uh, uh, um, would have to create in some very oddball ways. So let, let, we're going to kind of start to the left a little bit and kind of work our way, way right as I explain what's going on here. This particular machine, what I'm showing you anyway, has two 10 gigabit in Ethernet interfaces and a one gig inter uh, Ethernet interface that physically connects into two various switches. The uh, um, the two 10 gig interfaces use LACP, which is that is 8023AD. That is LACP, 8023AD, dynamic link aggregation. Those are all synonymous uh, um, terms. Um, it bonds those two interfaces into um, a, a 20 gigabit per second uh, um, bond. So again, I can only get on a single stream 10 gigabits per second on that, but I can get across multiple streams up to 20 gigabits. I also gain by having LACP, I do have some failover. If one of the interfaces go down, all of the traffic will, will switch over to the other one and vice versa, um, just inside of that bond. Now, one of the things that you can't do with, um, at least you're not, you shouldn't do, with 802.3AD or LACP, is you can't have interfaces that are different speeds. This, this, this breaks all kinds of assumptions with the way LACP works if you do that. Um, so, let's say that you, you want a situation where you've got a switch that, that has two um, LACP, uh, 802.3AD, uh, bond, uh, bonded interfaces on it. What happens when that switch goes down? Well, on this particular machine, I do have a spare gigabit uh, uh, Ethernet interface that I have actually uh, uh, bonded to the bond. So, bond zero is actually a, a member of bond one. It is the active um, primary uh, uh, interface for bond one. 
it then has a backup interface of ETH2. Now, everything from Bond0 and Bond1 is all on the same logical network. They're on the same VLAN, they're on the same, you know, physical, effectively the same physical fabric. So they can actually get to the same places. And what I can do uh, um, from Bond1 is I can actually, you know, transit out on either the, the, the Bond0, i.e. ETH0, ETH1, which are both 10 gig interfaces, or if those are down for some reason, it will fail over automatically the ETH2. There might be a little bit of delay just as uh, um, MAC addresses move around and it gets a little complicated, but that, that is what is expected to happen. Now, th this is where the diagram forks a little bit. Bridge zero uh, um, has an IP address associated to it. One, two, three, four. Don't ever actually use that IP address. That's actually a real <laughs> IP address for an entity down in Australia. Um, but the, the bridge for this particular machine is actually the primary interface for how it gets out to the internet. So bridge zero is attached to bond one, which is attached to bond zero and ETH two, and bond zero is attached to ETH zero and ETH one. Got it. Now, bridge zero in this particular case would be what most people would see as ETH zero or whatever your default network interface is. I can assign IP addresses to it. I can, you know, treat it exactly like you would normally do, you know, exactly, you know, like ETH0, except that there's these other layers of pieces to the other side of it that define how it's going to work. The other upside that I can do with the bridge is, as you can see with VM1, is VM1 can actually talk to bridge zero. So it can actually transit out the same interfaces that uh, um, that the main system is transiting. That means they're on the same network segment. That means that VM1, if it needed to talk to the, the host machine, doesn't even need to leave the, the, the confines of the actual computer. It can just talk to the bridge and the bridge will bounce back into the main host and that entire communication will happen there. Now VM1 also can talk to bridge one. So there's two bridges in this network. As you can see, bridge one does not actually have an IP address assigned to it. It is literally just a bridge. From the perspective of the, the, the host machine here, it is just a, a bridge. It can't talk to it. Um, it could technically uh, uh, wire shark uh, uh, information out of it, but it's not going to get to, to talk on that interface on its own because it doesn't have an IP address on that network segment. And you'll also note that bridge one not only is attached to VM1 and VM2, but it's attached to bond 1.22. It's actually attached to a virtual or a VLAN interface. So once we've got bond one up, you create a new uh, um, VLAN uh, uh, tag, uh, 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 22, a, a VLAN interface, and then that gets uh, 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 attached to the bridge. Now, what this means is that when VM1 or VM2, VM2 specifically, wants to talk out, it is going to talk to the bridge, and then that bridge is going to talk to, to bond 1.22. That means that all traffic that um, comes out of bridge one will all be tagged as VLAN 22. So when it goes out of um, ETH0, ETH1, or ETH2, ultimately on the far side there, it will actually still retain its VLAN tag of 22, which means it will sit on whatever you know VLAN segment is 22. Okay, that is a lot to take in uh, uh, at this point. Um, um, and again, you know, is this real? Yes, this is actually running in production right now. The, the, what I'm actually showing you is a simplified uh, uh, version of that. It's not even, uh, um, but my actual setup is, is, is um, far more complicated than this and, and, and slightly deeper and weirder. Um, but why would you do this? Well, in the case of the bond, bond zero and bond one, failures happen, switches die. And um, computers these days, particularly servers, come with so many network interfaces um, that you can actually do these kinds of things. I mean, I, I've got network, I, I've got servers right now that have four or eight network ports on the motherboard without having to, to do anything. 
by the time you slap a couple of 10 gig net network cards in there, you've got somewhere between six and eight network interfaces on, on a system. There's really at some point no reason not to take uh, more advantage of these physical interfaces um, that you have access to. Um, and, and when you plan for failure and, and you make these things work this way, this just means that when your switch dies or you have to reboot a switch or something, you know, things may get slower, but they don't fall over and die. So this is something to, to kind of think about a lot um, when, when you're, you're building these things. It also, particularly for the purposes of this, uh, um, th this talk, it gives a really interesting example of, example of how the stacking or layering of all these pieces can go together. Now, I kind of alluded to this a little bit uh, uh, earlier in that uh, um, the, the various distributions have different ways of configuring their, their networks, and they all do. Red Hat, Fedora, CentOS all use um, one of two ways, um, either the old Sys5 um, uh, networking scripts or they, they've all kind of moved in more recent distros um, or distro versions uh, to using network man uh, network manager. Um, Debian has always had its own you know network interfaces uh, a way of bringing this kind of stuff up. Um, Ubuntu has Netplan and uh, um, System D, Network D, and like the, the, basically every distro has reinvented the wheel on how you define how to bring up your network. Some of this is good. This means that there's a new and different and interesting ways of how to, to come at this problem. This is also bad because if you switch between distros a lot, you have to figure out how this works across a number of different distros. Um, and not all of the P not all of the, the systems that do this configuration can handle everything. So, you know, again, stuff like Debian um, don't really handle teaming very well, whereas Red Hat and Fedora do. So I want to kind of... Um, show you a, a little bit of what the these configuration files look like i know that there's no way that i'm going to really be able to explain all of this um but uh, uh the the pulled from the, the the example this is actually a um more the configuration file that ends up generating um those image uh, those those diagrams from the last couple of slides um You've got the, the loopback interface, you've got standard E0, um, you've then got a, a bond interface uh, uh, called bond admin. You'll note that you don't actually have to, to stick to the 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 nomenclature. You can actually just kind of name interfaces whatever you want. Um, yay. Uh, um, uh, um, you've got bond admin, you've got ETH1, and you've got some other 10 gig physical interfaces. Um, bond one, bond one nineteen. You've got a, a a bridge interface, another bridge interface, and a couple of VLAN tags. Um, so, uh, 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 um, yeah. So, so this does a lot that's going on there. I'm gonna leave this to the to to people who find this to go over and take a look at this. This would take far too long to try and piece it all out. But this more or less will generate the, the pieces um, from the last couple of slides. And not to leave Red Hat, CentOS, and Fedora kind of out, I wanted to show a similar setup. This does not actually generate the same thing, but I also wanted to, to get something in here that kind of showed off teaming. Um, this builds up a, a, a similar set of interfaces uh, um, using the, the, the system that, that Red Hat, CentOS, and Fedora tend to prefer. Um, and as you can see, there, there, there's a bunch of different files involved here. Um, particularly, uh, Network Manager will, will put these together in the right order. It, it, it will parse them down and go, oh, well, you know, Team Zero needs, you know, uh, uh, this up and this up and this up before it can it, it can do other um, bits and pieces. Um, and you'll also note that I've got a bond zero and a team zero in this this example. They actually do slightly different things. Um, and you can have both a bond and a team on the same system. There is no reason that that, that doesn't work. Um, but you can also see a bridge and some physical interfaces. And you can see in the bridge that, you know, that's where, you know, the GHCP actually gets uh, pulled in and where none of the rest of these things other than Team Zero has DHCP uh, uh, and those kinds of stuff. So now this is a lot. I know that this is a lot. This is 
there, there, there's no way that I, I can even cover a lot of these topics in, in enough detail, uh, particularly in an hour, to to really do them justice. Um, the Linux documentation project uh, uh, link, the first one there, has an exhaustive uh, 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 set of links to other documentation. A lot of it's going to be fairly technical um, and very low level, but it will also um, do a fairly good job of trying to explain what's going on. Um, Libteam uh, um, is a great place to go and learn about um, uh, the network teaming uh, uh, driver stuff um, and the, the networking ton tap stuff. I mean, pretty much anything in the networking directory is going to be relevant to this. So hopefully I've gotten through some of this and helped demystify a little bit of this. I know that this is a lot to take in and there's a lot going on here. Um, if you have questions, comments, uh, um, please, by all means, uh, you can find me on IRC, Twitter, um email me I, I i'm i try not to be hard to to find and i i'm more than happy to uh answer questions or go over things um again i hope you found this useful and with that thank you very much